And I'm now, go I'm now going to ask uh, Candice Millard to uh, uh, kick off the conference itself. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Jean-Paul. And thank you to the National World War I Museum, which is an icon of Kansas City and one of the most exceptional museums in the world. And we are so proud to have you in Kansas City. And thank you to the International Churchill Society for inviting me to join you today. It's a tremendous, tremendous honor. Um, more than 10 years ago, when I decided that I was going to attempt to write a book about Winston Churchill. I was, frankly, terrified. I can't imagine a historical figure who is more fascinating and irresistible than Churchill, whose life is filled with more astonishing stories. It's insanely fertile ground for a writer, but it is also incredibly intimidating. Of course, Churchill himself was larger than life, but I also knew that I would be entering not just a crowded field, but one filled with some of the world's most respected and accomplished historians and writers, analysts and archivists. Among them are the men and women whom you will have the great pleasure of hearing speak today at this conference. They will immerse you in some of the most important, surprising, inspiring, at times jaw-dropping stories of Winston Churchill's life stories of conflict, but also of character. It is an extremely impressive lineup brought to us by an extraordinarily relevant and vibrant organization, the International Churchill Society. And I cannot wait to get started. So let's do just that. Our first lecturer is a well-known face here at the National World War I Museum. Sean McMeekin is the, Flance, or the, I'm sorry, the Francis Flournoy Professor of European History and Culture at Bard College. Educated at Stanford and the University of California, he is the author of several prize-winning books that deal with Russia, Germany, and the Ottoman Empire during the era of the First World War. His most recent book, however, is Stalin's War, which takes an inside look at the Second World War from the perspective of the Soviet Union. His lecture today is titled Churchill and Stalin at War, 1939 to 45. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Sean McMeekin. Well, thank you, Candace, for that <clears throat> kind introduction, and uh, thank, thank uh, all the organizers for bringing me here once again. It's great to be back here in Kansas City at the World War I Museum. Uh, in, in view of the location and having written five books on the First World War, I almost feel like I should be talking about Churchill at war in the First World War. Um, I sometimes tell my students, well, actually, my students now are too young to get the reference. I used to tell my students that that Churchill, in addition to being a great statesman, was something like a Forrest Gump character in the first half of the 20th century. There's a key moment he's there. You know, he might be in power, he might be behind the scenes, but he's certainly there, you know, whether it's actually fighting on the Western Front or whether it's in the entry of the Ottoman Empire into the war, the Dardanelles, the Gallipoli Campaign, the Russian Civil War. Perhaps that's a good place to begin, the Russian Civil War, because it does lay the seeds for some of the complexity, really, of the relationship between Churchill and Stalin and the Soviet Union in the second. Um, so once again, Churchill, of course, having played an important role, mostly as First Lord of the Admiralty after he was kind of somewhat unfairly scapegoated for the Dardanelles and Gallipoli disaster, and he actually takes a commission on the Western Front, as most of you know. Uh, he came back into the government under Lloyd George, serving various roles, Minister of War, Minister of Munitions, and in that government, which was a slightly awkward coalition government in which Lloyd George was, well, you know, shall we say, he was a, he was a slightly uh, slippery character. It was sometimes hard to pin down exactly where he stood on things. So that he was helping the group we usually call the whites in the Russian Civil War, that is the opponents of the communists, the opponents of the Bolsheviks. They didn't call themselves whites. This is one of the countless examples of the way in which communist spin 
continues to define our understanding of 20th century history. They didn't call themselves whites. They were not fighting to restore the Tsar to his throne. They were fighting to restore the Constituent Assembly, that is, the deposed Democratic Parliament of Russia, which the Bolsheviks had suppressed by force in January 1918. So they weren't whites, but the armies that we usually refer to as whites, fighting against the Bolsheviks. Churchill was a great proponent of aiding them. He thought communism would be a menace, already was a menace, a threat to the peace of Europe. On uh, one of uh, many immortal Churchill lines, although perhaps not the most widely quoted, he said, one might as well legalize sodomy as recognize the Bolsheviks, thus perhaps proving how slightly out of touch he would be with the mores of the later 20th and early 21st centuries. <laughs> but this was his view of communism. However, he was not, of course, empowered in the end Lloyd George more or less, I'm not going to say he sold the whites down the river. It's more like he kind of, he took away the life raft. Stopped the Baltic blockade, allowed them to begin rearming over the Baltic, importing German arms, melting gold down in Stockholm and Copenhagen of all places to pay for imported arms from the West. As we know, they, they do in the end win the Civil War. So Churchill, he had already emerged in the consciousness of some of the Soviet leaders as a kind of an adversary. Uh, Stalin, although again not yet fully in power, his first major position was nationalities commissar. Uh, he would later play a role, not necessarily a constructive role, on the battlefield in the Russian Civil War. He was actually heavily involved in the Polish-Soviet War of 1920, which actually led Poland to expand uh, her borders uh, after initially nearly losing everything, the miracle of, of the Vistula River. Um, so Churchill has already emerged as a something of a bogeyman, I think, in Soviet eyes. And Stalin certainly remembered him. He remembered the British. It's an important thing to remember about the Second World War. Although, with hindsight, we know that there will eventually be a grand alliance of the big three in all of this. Um, Stalin, for the better part of really the first, I don't even know when, when you date the war, certainly up to 1941 and maybe even into 1942, continued to view the Anglo-Saxons as something of his ultimate adversary and enemy. They were the imperialists. Britain was the arch-imperialist power. Um, and if you pay attention to Soviet rhetoric, of course they talk about capitalism. There's a lot about capitalism, but the, the anti-imperialism was always a critical element in Soviet agitprop. So the British were really the ultimate enemy, and Churchill, as the arch-imperialist of the British Empire, albeit a liberal one, was definitely seen as something of an ultimate adversary. So to fast forward the story a little bit, I'm not going to go all the way up to the war. I think Munich is a good place to start. We're going to be hearing a lot about Munich later today. I'm going to tell you a slightly different version of the story of Munich. So there's, there's this uh, litany of um, almost kind of uh, criticism that comes in the direction of the Western powers in the diplomatic literature on the 1930s, the failure of collective security. Many diplomatic historians, and I have tussled with some of them over the years, continue to assert that the failure of collective security reflected a kind of, uh, almost a political prejudice on the, on, on the part of the Western powers, Britain and France, because they didn't trust Stalin, they didn't trust the Soviet Union, you see. They, they, they didn't really, they had this, this irrational anti-communist prejudice. Had they trusted Stalin, the word goes, there could have been an alliance. A couple of problems with that. To begin with, I actually don't need my pointer here because you can see a big, big red dot. It's supposed to be a circle. This was kind of a computer glitch. What it is supposed to illustrate, although you can kind of get the idea from where the dot is, is that the Soviet Union did not border Czechoslovakia. Um, they did have a certain sort of mutual... Uh, defense agreement with Czechoslovakia, and theoretically they were supposed to, in some very theoretical world, come to Czechoslovakia's aid if Czechoslovakia were menaced by Nazi Germany, but everyone knew this was basically a, just a, a sort of a paper agreement. Not only was there no formal obligation, but to get to Czechoslovakia, the Soviets would have had to invade, well, either Poland or Romania. To do anything against the Germans, meanwhile, and this is also going to factor into 1939, the Soviets once again would have had to invade Poland, or after the Germans had, of course, absorbed much of Czechoslovakia, Romania. So the idea of collective security was, first of all, it was sort of a fantasy. There was nothing the Soviets really could have done, nor did they, of course, intend to do it. Uh, Stalin, in 1938, wrote this book. I'm not going to give you the full unadulterated title. We'll just summarize the short course. It's sort of a Bible of international communism, describing everything about the ideology, the, the world situation, etc. The word collective security does not appear. There's a lot of talk about the Second Imperialist War. So this is how Stalin and the Soviets view things. The First Imperialist War had midwifed communism into existence. The Second would, 
usher in the communist triumph across the globe. The capitalist powers would destroy each other. Now, this was a prospect with which the Soviets actually regarded with great relish. Stalin, in fact, at Munich, and this is my version of the Munich story, a little bit different than the traditional one, Stalin was disappointed at Munich because war didn't break out. It would have been a pretty little war with which others would have fought. That was actually what he was hoping would come out of Munich. Uh, that was actually the words of the German ambassador, but interestingly enough, Chamberlain said something quite similar. And they weren't wrong. This is how he viewed the prospect of war. In fact, here's an interesting snapshot of the Soviet response to Munich. Pravda published an editorial, rather cackling, as it were. The Poles are digging a graveyard for Polish independence. Maybe I should do that in a Russian accent. Poles are digging graveyard for Polish independence. Poles are digging grave. What on earth does that mean? Well, I'm going to say a lot of nice things about Poland as we go, so maybe you, you can forgive me this one trespass if there are any Poles in the audience. Munich was not Poland's finest moment. Poland actually did seize territory from Czechoslovakia as well, a much uh, smaller slice, Teshin, basically. But so the Poles have helped in the carving up of Czechoslovakia. Poland, actually, we do forget this. Poland had something of an alliance treaty with Germany between 1934 and 1939. So what the Soviets began talking about in 1938 was carving up Poland. Yes, you've all heard about the invasion of Poland in 1939, the partition of Poland. It was a Soviet proposal, not a German one. The Soviets started talking about it all through 1938, first in theoretical journals, then in hints through back channels, ambassadors, etc. They start talking about the idea of carving up Poland together with the Germans. It was actually a Soviet proposal. It was a Soviet initiative. And things got going in, the, in a really much stronger sense when on the 3rd of May, 1939, Stalin fired his Jewish foreign affairs commissar, Maxim Litvinov, or Finkelstein, as the Nazis called him in their anti-Semitic propaganda. He didn't just fire his Jewish foreign affairs commissar, mind you. He, he also instructed Molotov. This is, of course, code name. Molotov was a uh, hammer to Stalin's steel. They both co-signed a lot of death quotas together in the terror, perhaps cackling as they did so. He told Molotov to chuck all the Jews out of foreign affairs commissariat. So they fired all the Jews, not literally every single one. I mean, that was probably beyond their ken. Uh, this was a signal to Hitler. Hitler got the message, by the way. He immediately told Goebbels and, and his press chief, you know, basically stop attacking the Soviets. You know, deals, a deal's basically now kind of uh, on the up. So as the war clouds are darkening over Europe, and Churchill is not part of this story, because as you know, he's not in power. In fact, now interestingly, back in March, when Chamberlain issued his ill-fated so-called guarantee to Poland, um, which notoriously guaranteed Polish independence, but not her territorial integrity, thus leaving certain wiggle room. And he's often been, been criticized for this justly. I mean, it was kind of unfortunate messaging at the very least. The Germans kind of saw it as maybe, in, you know, it's maybe an invitation to invade Poland. The Poles unfortunately saw it perhaps forlornly and tragically as a British guarantee, which it really wasn't of her borders. Um, now, Chamberlain, admittedly, I mean, he's, he's, he's in a fractious position. If he, if he had guaranteed more, he probably would have had a cabinet crisis on his hands. Or if, let's say, he had brought Churchill into the government, everyone knew where Churchill stood on Hitler, of course, then you know, possibly the Germans would have seen that as a commitment to fight, and he wasn't really ready for that yet. All this is pretty familiar, but what not everyone knows about the guarantee to Poland is that, remember that thing about the Soviets and collective security? No, the Soviets, uh, they refused Chamberlain's overtures. They refused to agree to his guarantee. Not only did they refuse to agree to it, even quietly, even in private, they explicitly repudiated it quite loudly. They actually said no. And in fact, when, when rumors got out that the Soviets had quietly agreed to his guarantee to Polish borders, the Soviets said no, because the Soviets, of course, did not want to guarantee Poland's borders, because they, of course, had territorial ambitions in Poland. In fact, as we know, if we actually look at the partition map, the Soviet zone was actually supposed to be larger than the German one. Uh, the original Molotov, and this is the kind of stuff, again, I think as we were hearing yesterday from Kasparov, something you're not really allowed to talk about in Russia these days, but the Molotov Rippentrop, so-called Molotov Rippentrop, actually Moscow Pact, um, you can actually see the borders did not actually match what eventually happens. If you look at some of the gaps here, uh, the Soviets were originally supposed to have this zone all the way up to Warsaw, you know, basically kind of half and half. In fact, the Soviet zone was larger. Um, what happened in the end is that because the, the Soviets delayed so long in invading, 
the Germans actually overstepped the demarcation lines, so they had to do some haggling, and effectively, the, uh, the Germans got central Poland in exchange for Lithuania. Which, and you have to give Stalin and Molotov credit for this. They were brilliant when it came to sort of diplomacy and public relations. So they got to claim, you say, well, we didn't really conquer Poland. We only conquered this eastern part of it where there were a lot of Ukrainians and Belarusians. And that, that was the line. They, it, was a, it wasn't a war, you see. I, I, was, uh, I was reminded of this last year on, on the 4th of July, no less, when I was personally denounced by the Russian foreign ministry. Uh, that the Soviet Union was a peace-loving empire, and the Soviet Union did not aggress or, or violate others' territories. So you see, this was not a war. It was not an invasion. It was a protection mission, as Molotov put it, uh, to protect our beleaguered Ukrainian and Belarusian brothers. Um, they called in Poland's ambassador. They said, you know, protection mission underway. Your country no longer exists. Off to the gulag with you. Um, really brilliant episode in Soviet diplomacy. But Curiously, and again, because I'm going to say a lot of really nice things about him as we go, Churchill now is in the government. Oddly enough, he's reprising his role as First Lord of the Admiralty, same role he had in 1914. Churchill actually goes on BBC Radio, and he defends the Soviet move into eastern Poland in the interests of Soviet security, he says. Ivan Maisky, the Soviet ambassador, calls him in and actually thanks him for this. Churchill, it's true, had a great historical imagination and memory. Having lived through the First World War, he still tended to see the Russians, despite obviously being an anti-communist, he tended to see the Russians as an ally against the Germans. And again, in this, it, he probably wasn't wrong. They were a counterweight to the Germans in Eastern Europe. They were a counterweight, among other places, in the Baltic area, in Finland. Uh, we tend to forget this again, because after the Germans and the Soviets carved up Poland in September, that winter, the main story in Europe was actually Finland, the Soviet invasion of Finland. Um, this was kind of the last episode, you might say, of the war, serious episode, involving serious fighting during the so-called phony war, as the French call it, the Drôle de Guerre, or as the Germans call it more evocatively, the Sitzkrieg. Uh, it was during this conflict, actually, that, I mean, curiously enough, I mean, this is what the world media was focusing on. People forget this, too, but... The Soviets were expelled from the League of Nations in December 1939 after they brutally invaded Finland. The League secretary rather caustically observed, well, at least Germany, Italy, and Japan had the decency to resign from the League before committing acts of flagrant armed aggression. The Soviets had not even resigned from the League. They just went ahead and, and they did it. Um, and this is something that I, I know is a little bit of a sensitive topic in Britain. I know this because there were a couple of reviews of my books that didn't really want to talk about it. But Britain nearly went to war with the Soviet Union in early 1940 because of the invasion of Finland, but also because, and this is a part, again, that everyone tends to forget, the Soviets were not just agreeing with the Germans about carving up Eastern Europe, they were also fueling the German war machine, particularly in Baku and the Caspian. The Germans were getting roughly a third of their natural petroleum resources from the Soviets. They were getting about half from Romania. Um, and so the British actually conducted, I think I have this map here, yeah, they actually conducted a number of surveillance raids here over both Baku and Batumi. You can see the dates there, March 30th, 1940, April 5th, 1940. Um, now, they very nearly went to war. And this is when, you know, Stalin in some ways would, it was at his best when cornered, if I'm going to give Stalin a little bit of credit here. Uh, he received a lot of intel reports about these plans. He knew what they were planning on doing. He commissioned a lot of reports from actually American uh, geologists and oil engineers, what might happen if there were saturation bombing of, of the oil derricks around Baku. Um, and this is one, curiously enough, uh, the reviewers of my book totally missed this part, but the upshot of all of this was Stalin did two things. He was desperate. So first he sued for peace with Finland, and it was a slightly punitive peace, but we, which he didn't really get all of what he wanted. And that cut the legs out from under British and French plans to possibly intervene against him. And they were talking about sending an echelon of troops to Finland in addition to waging these bombing raids. Oh, the other thing he did was order the Katyn massacre. This is when they actually had, believe it or not, they had a death quota, and they went down to five digits, roughly 25,000. In the end, they didn't quite get that many. They only killed 22,892. They weren't all officers. There were a lot of former regime officials, merchants, elites. Roughly 15,000 were Polish officers because Stalin didn't want a fifth column on his hands. He had tried to scatter all the Polish elites throughout various gulag labor camps, forestry, etc. Uh, now he had decapitated any possible Polish resistance to him. Now this crime, somewhat famously, a little bit later, 
The Soviets, of course, will accuse the Germans of doing it in Nuremberg. And in fact, they admitted to it in 1990. They're starting to deny it again now, rather sadly. There are a lot of books coming out in Russia denying responsibility. But this is sort of, in, in some ways, the last failure, you might say, of the Chamberlain government. And it's kind of curious, because although they, they, in the end they dithered it, this is Chamberlain's typical Chamberlain, dither or delay, a lot of talk, in the end they didn't quite do anything. In fact, curiously enough, they sent a man you might have heard of, Fitzroy McLean, uh, one of Churchill's envoy to Tito in 1943. They sent Fitzroy McLean, he was on a mission. He was supposed to go to Syria, uh, where the French had their Middle Eastern command and basically planned together this war against the Soviet Union. He arrived in Paris a couple of days before the Germans invaded France and the Low Countries. So he had a front row seat for the fall of France. He never made it to Syria. So everyone kind of forgot about all of this. Oh, that's a Katyn map. I'm not going to go through that. But very, very briefly, because I think my time is somewhat limited. Churchill, of course, does come into power, as we all know, in May 1940, during the kind of the debacle in France or the Low Countries. It doesn't start well for Churchill or for Britain. This is kind of Britain's pattern in most modern wars. They tend to lose a lot in the early stages before uh, they get their act together. But Churchill, curiously enough, was viewed by Stalin as a great improvement over Chamberlain. Um, you know, and, and not for no reason. Chamberlain, after all, had nearly gone to war with him and had very nearly bombed his oil fields. Um, Churchill came to power, and yes, Britain's situation was increasingly desperate, especially after the fall of France. And it's that period, the, I guess we call it usually the finest hour period, Britain fighting alone and so on, that you know, he really is at his most desperate. And obviously, he's hoping the Americans will get in the war, but if not the Americans, then maybe the Soviets. So he sends a man called Stafford Cripps is his ambassador to Moscow. Stafford Cripps was a labor MP, something of a com He wasn't a, a communist exactly, but he was certainly friendly. We might call him a fellow traveler. He was, he was a bit friendlier to the Soviets than otherwise. And, and Churchill was hoping that basically, not least because the Germans, while they were bogged down in France and the Low Countries, they had actually left their eastern border basically undefended. There was a lot of chatter that summer about what if the Soviets had actually turned on their partners and invaded. There was a lot of chatter about that. In fact, there was even some chatter that the Soviets could unleash some of those Polish troops and officers and uh, turn on the Germans in summer 1940. And they talked about this in London, and Sikorsky, head of the Polish exile government, actually proposed it to Churchill's government. Unfortunately, neither of them knew that those 15,000 Polish officers had actually just been murdered. They didn't know that yet. Uh, so those plans kind of came to nothing. And poor Cripps, he tries to get an audience with Stalin. Stalin sees him once just to kind of pat him on the head and pretend to be nice. But he offers Churchill nothing. And this is, <laughs> this is kind of his pattern for most of the war. He really does. He kind of offers Churchill nothing. Uh, Churchill keeps writing him these letters, a whole series of letters. You know, basically like, you know, you, you've got to understand Hitler's going to turn on you eventually. Like, you know, wake up to the threat. Please, please, please. Stalin doesn't respond to any of them until four weeks after Barbarossa when he finally decides it's time to answer one of poor Winston Churchill's letters. Uh, just briefly about Barbarossa itself, because, again, I'm, I, I don't have time to go into the details of the book. There's a lot of granular detail about this. Um, but the Soviets had a massive arsenal. Uh, and part of the reason this matters from the perspective of Churchill is that while he did try to warn them, and in fact, even those warnings were, shall we say, not appreciated by Stalin. You know, after Rudolf Hess shows up in, in Scotland, Stalin thinks that the reason Churchill is sending him all these warnings about Hitler's military preparations is because he's trying to get me to violate the pact and give the Germans an excuse to invade. He's very, very bitter about this. You know, he thinks Hess is actually working for the British, those dastardly imperialists. Um, so he doesn't really take Churchill's advice. He doesn't heed the warnings, as we know, the Germans invade. Now, the Soviets, at least on paper, should have been fine. I mean, they had massive amounts of ar armor, as you can see, particularly here in the southwest. In fact, they actually did order a counter-strike. Uh, it's very, very small on this map. You see a lot of dark black arrows. That's the Germans. Uh, so what the Soviets are actually trying to do is, right here, they're actually trying to invade Lublin. That was actually the, the direction. As we know, it doesn't go well. Uh, the Soviets nearly collapsed in 1941, and that's what led Churchill into, I think, one of his most heroic and even self-sacrificing actions, even though Britain herself was beleaguered and struggling against Nazi Germany. And, I mean, frankly, uh, during the Battle of Britain, Stalin wasn't just neutral, of course. He was actually fueling the Luftwaffe as it was terrorizing, well, first, you know, the, the countryside and then eventually London. So Churchill didn't have to help. Uh, Churchill, after all, was a lifelong anti-communist, but he said, you know, there's a famous speech about this kind of, you know, all the crimes of communism washes away in the drama of what's happening, and 
He sends famously the 200 Hawker Hurricane fighters, which had been pledged to defend Singapore. Uh, he then sends along, he re-gifts a lot of American Lend-Lease equipment, including Douglas A-20 Havoc bombers. Um, he promises roughly 200 pursuit planes a month, Spitfires, Hurricanes. He sends these Matilda and Valentine tanks. That was in some ways the most interesting action because you look about this, uh, there's a great Lend-Lease historian who said, you know, Churchill's offer of the, of, of the Valentines and the Matildas to Stalin was sort of like a bankrupt pauper uh, demanding, uh, sorry, a bankrupt millionaire demanding help from a pauper. Churchill was the pauper. Britain's entire tank park numbered about 1,770, and he sent Stalin 400 tanks. More than a quarter of Britain's entire tank park. The Soviets had, at the beginning of the war, 25,000 tanks. By December, they didn't have 25,000 tanks. And in fact, the Battle of Moscow, I can't tell you how I got any of this information, because I think I'm no longer allowed into Russia, and I think some of my archival helpers are now on various lists. But I was able to discover that Lend-Lease aid from both Britain and the United States, in particular Britain's re-gifted American Lend-Lease aid, played a decisive role at the Battle of Moscow, December 1941, uh, played a decisive role at Stalingrad, even more so at Stalingrad, um, in late 1942 into January 43, and uh, yet again at Kursk the following summer, and even Bagration, the great Soviet uh, offensive into Belarus in 1944, when despite these vaunted claims of the Soviets, oh, we don't like your tanks, they're death traps, we have great T-34. T-34, by the way, was based on an American Christie suspension, just for the record. But in addition to that, it, the Soviets, even as late as 44, when they supposedly have recovered all their industrial might, a third of the tanks in Operation Bagration were British, American, and Canadian tanks. So Churchill made a conscious decision to sacrifice to some extent, British imperial interests in the interest of saving the Soviets and keeping them in the war. It's why it's particularly ironic that so many of, of Churchill's critics from the left these days say, well, it wasn't really Churchill who won the war, it was Stalin. Well, yes, with massive amounts of Lend-Lease aid. Uh, in particular, things like processed aluminum, or aluminum, which the British desperately needed for their own aircraft production, which were sent to Stalin instead in 41 and 42. Um, so it was a heroic act of self-sacrifice. Churchill did wise up, though, and you could begin to see by 1943 there's a shift. Here is when Churchill and Roosevelt begin to diverge. First of all, Britain stops sending aluminum, aluminum because she needs it, and of course Britain is starting to lose a lot of her power and authority. Roosevelt, okay, I suppose he had more aluminum to spare, but in addition to that, he simply didn't view Stalin in the same way that Churchill did. You can see this if you, if you read any of the transcripts from Tehran. It's quite shocking, actually, the way Roosevelt treats Churchill at Tehran, uh, deliberately mocking him on one occasion, insulting him. Churchill, in the end, is kind of fighting this battle alone without any help from, from the U.S. president. Um, there are a couple of famous lines at the conference. Everyone remembers the line when, when um, you know, Churchill said God was on the side of the Allies, and, and Stalin said, and so is the devil. The devil's a good communist. So God and the devil were on the side of the Allies. But Churchill, of course, was increasingly boxed in. Uh, his last stand comes on November 29, 1943. Last stand for the British Empire, that is. Uh, standing as such. Um, and this is when he made the last push. And it's interesting that, I, I admit I'm a little bit of a revisionist in general, as I'm often called, but... The one thing everyone else criticizes Churchill for in the Second World, I think, was his finest moment. The so-called Mediterranean, or better, Adriatic stratagem. Okay, so this is when Churchill was hoping that because the Allies now had 500,000 troops in Italy, not that that counted as a second front, the Soviets wanted a second front, second front. The Russians have been telling me for years about spam was your second front. Yeah, Italy doesn't count, nor, of course, were the Soviets helping against Japan. That's another story. But Churchill was hoping that with 500,000 troops in Italy and 68-odd landing craft, maybe the Allies could do something in the Eastern Mediterranean. Maybe they could land troops in Yugoslavia to aid Tito and the partisans, no longer really Mihailovich. Maybe they could take Rhodes, the Dodecanese Islands, lure Turkey into the war. Roosevelt actually at one point proposed the same thing before he was chided by Harry Hopkins under the table, sort of a, a rather insidious note passed under the table that maybe the Allies could even link up with the Red Army in the Balkans as the Red Army was advancing from Odessa. Actually, that was Roosevelt. The Red Army was at the time nowhere near Odessa, just for the record, but he was thinking ahead maybe four or five months. Stalin, of course, vetoed all of this. He did not want British or American troops on the ground anywhere in the Balkans or Eastern Europe. 
Roosevelt had even promised at one point, and, and Churchill had agreed to this, to send pilots to actually help the Soviets out in the North Caucasus over the skies of Stalingrad. No Stalin, no, I want your planes, no pilots, just planes. Uh, later in 45, he doesn't want any Americans or Britons on the ground in Poland. He's quite explicit about all this. Um, unfortunately, as we know, Roosevelt sided with Stalin. And as Hopkins put it, kind of putting the knife into Churchill at the last minute, you know, he said, you should, this is Harry Hopkins, by the way, sleeps in the Lincoln bedroom during the war. He said, you should know that the Soviet view is equally adamant. Interesting, Hopkins seemed to be speaking for the Soviets as much as for the Americans. Well, Churchill makes this last stand. You know, he wants the possibility of a delay in Overlord to allow the Allies to do something in the Mediterranean. In the end, it doesn't happen. He actually proposed as late as the Quebec Conference of September 1944 that maybe the Allies could do something to get troops into Yugoslavia uh, before the Soviets conquered all in Eastern Europe. Roosevelt, of course, said no. He was mostly interested at that point in the Morgenthau Plan, which he forced Churchill to agree to and essentially sign on to, as, as Churchill put it at that point. What do you want me to do? Beg like uh, Fela. That was, uh, that was Roosevelt's dog. Roosevelt was really sticking to Churchill by this time. Now, as we know, Churchill does make one final trip to Moscow, tries to negotiate to save something from the burning. In the end, he's able to save Greece, which was obviously better than nothing, but still much less that he could have saved had, had Roosevelt actually, I think, seen the wisdom of a stronger position on, on Stalin earlier on. Uh, one last point about Churchill and the Soviets. I'm just going to check the, uh, the clock here. Um, I think we started a few minutes late, so maybe I'll run on a few more minutes before questions. Um, he was trying to get, of course, Roosevelt also to wake up at Yalta. He had the best lines about Yalta. He always had the best lines about everything. You know, and, uh, uh, when Stalin made Roosevelt come to him at Yalta, despite Roosevelt being you know, effectively dying now with uh, uh, tremendously elevated blood pressure, um, and they had to actually fly across the Balkans, and the Germans still had a few anti-aircraft batteries there, and so they actually had to fly lower altitude because of Roosevelt's blood pressure conditions so that the plane wouldn't... Unfortunately, they're actually facing German anti-aircraft batteries, and, you know, they finally get to Yalta, and they've sort of cleansed everything of people, and there's nothing but AK NKVD officers on the streets. And, you know, Churchill said uh, visiting Yalta it was like the Riviera of Hades, he said. Um, um, well, so when they finally got there, and, you know, poor Churchill, Roosevelt's practically catatonic by this stage. He's, he's really not putting up much of a fight on, on almost anything. Um, curiously enough, the only thing he told Stalin that was significant at Yalta was that he wanted Stalin to revisit the claim from Tehran when he said he wanted to murder 50,000, he wanted to toast to murdering 50,000 captured German officers. That's when Churchill had actually stormed out of the room back in Yalta. Um, when Stalin had proposed that. Curiously enough, it entered the record and then it became policy of the U.S. Treasury Department under Henry Morgenthau, made its way to the Morgenthau plan. Churchill had actually said back then, you know, I would not stand for this infamy, you know, neither commons nor parliament or the British people will sully themselves, etc. Uh, Stalin later called him back and said he was joking and then he, he went over to him and he said, come here, Molotov, and tell me about your pact with Hitler. <laughs> uh, Stalin, he did have a slightly warped sense of humor at times. Um, but so Church, I mean, basically Roosevelt at Yalta, mostly he just wants, I suppose, Stalin to, you know, to kind of have these toasts, and he wants the United Nations, we all know about that. Churchill's trying to fight for Poland, he's trying. It's an uphill struggle, because he's getting no help from Roosevelt. He wants the Poles to have free elections, okay? Um, Stalin's retort to this is what, you mean free elections, like in British-occupied Egypt? Um, Roosevelt finally tried chiming in there, I think like in between naps, and he said, um, he said uh, uh, something to the effect that, uh, that he thought, yes, yes, Polish elections, they should, be, they should be as clean and pure as Caesar's wife. And uh, Stalin replied, Caesar's wife was no virgin. Um, so as we know, in the end, they didn't happen. They didn't get their observers. They didn't get their free elections in Poland. And the Iron Curtain descends upon Europe. Oh, yeah, so last point about Churchill and, and Stalin and the Soviets. He actually road-tested the phrase Iron Curtain as early as May 1245. So this is after Roosevelt has died and after Truman's come in. And, you know, shall we say Truman was, I think, thankfully no Roosevelt when it came to Stalin and the Soviets. He ends up, obviously, taking a much stronger line than, than Roosevelt had. Um, but Churchill, he did kind of go almost to the other extreme. He actually did propose at one point that maybe because Stalin had violated all of his promises on Poland that the Allies should go to war to win a square deal for Poland. Um, his generals deemed that operation unthinkable. Um, but he had laid down a marker, uh, the marker that he, of course, would, would then 
make even more famous with the Iron Curtain speech up in Fulton, Missouri in March of 46. Um, and he was certainly right that an Iron Curtain was descending upon Europe, but I guess the question remains, would it have descended either later or perhaps a little bit further to the east had uh, strong action been taken sooner? So I'm going to stop there and open the floor for questions. Ladies and gentlemen, on either side, you'll notice that there are microphones, and we'd welcome you to come down the stairs and ask your questions. If you are unable to come down the stairs, please wave, and our history and engagement specialist, James Taub, or myself, will be able to come to you. That, that was a great presentation, Sean, thank you. Oh, highly. Uh, <laughs> hi. Um, there are a small number of historians who um, sort of renegades who claim that Stalin was actually planning to attack Germany at the time Barbarossa broke out. And so I'm wondering what you think of that thesis. Yes, it's a great question. Um, and it's something of an explosive one, the so-called Suvorov thesis, the number of books published by the Soviet defector. Rezin was his real name. Suvorov was kind of a code name or pseudonym. Um, no, he didn't get everything right, and he didn't have access to the Soviet files when he was writing, because he was effectively a dissident, and he's in exile. But I think the thing a lot of Western historians don't realize is that since his book, the most famous English version was called Icebreaker, came out about 1990, is that for almost two decades, Russian researchers actually went into the archives and they probed the thesis. And, I mean, they, they discovered thousands of really intriguing documents. There is no kind of single smoking gun saying the Soviets were planning to attack or invade on a certain day. What you do see in the files, I'll, I'll try to answer as briefly as I can, you see a couple of important things. The Soviet war planning does get more and more offensive in nature, along with the deployment. Uh, I mean, I, my own discovery was that they built 199 out of 251 of their new air bases in the first six months of 1941, within basically a few minutes flying distance of the German Reich, basically all along the Reich, and this is true of all the new tank parks too. They're clearly preparing for war. They don't know exactly how and when it's going to break out. The last Soviet planning document we have, uh, which dates to May 15th, 1941, did use the phrase upredet protivnika, to forestall the adversary. But I think what they were expecting was that the Germans would sort of telegraph a giant punch, so to speak, and the Soviets would be able to meet it, you know, best laid plans and all of that. That is more or less what happened. It's just the Germans were much faster, and by the time the Soviets reacted, it was far too late. I mean, they had destroyed most of their warplanes on the ground. What you also see in the, the, the special files of the Politburo, which until recent were actually available in Argaspi in Moscow. I assume they've locked them up again now uh, because, because I got at them. Um, but anyway, what, what they show is that in the last week or so before Barbarossa is launched, they do see it's coming. There is a panic that's setting. It's kind of creeping dread. And what they, see, what, what they order at the last minute is, is muskirovka or camouflage. Last minute orders to camouflage all the new air bases and tank parks and fuel stations, dummy warplanes, dummy tanks. The target dates are July 5th, July 15th, July 25th. The Germans, of course, struck on June 22nd. So they were far too late. They saw it coming, but in the end, you know, the Germans beat them to the punch. Uh, you mentioned several times access to archives, lack of access, and also the difference between, let's say, how the Russian people might perceive World War II based on what they're being educated. Sure. And I'd be interested in your thoughts as to what the big differences are between how we perceive the Eastern Front versus how the Russian people are taught the Eastern Front. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, I suppose, an apples and oranges comparison. I'm not sure who are the apples and who are the oranges. Um, but uh, there was a time, maybe the 90s and the aughts, when things were converging a little bit more between Soviet views of the war and our own. And for a time, there was even a Lend-Lease Museum in Moscow to kind of celebrate U.S. and British contributions on the Eastern Front. They closed that down about five or six years ago, and I doubt it'll ever open again. And Lend-Lease is kind of a dirty word you really don't want to use over in Russia. But no, the, the, the more chauvinistic view, which is, of course, increasingly emerging in Russia, they just kind of ignore us. I mean, we're just, we're not really part of the story, to be really, it's kind of funny that we have our own version of this with kind of, you know, focus on, on D-Day and on the Western Front with, yeah, we know what's going on in the East, but it's not always necessarily at the forefront of our minds. There's a sort of mirror image of that where, you know, you almost get the sense from some of the chatter coming from the Russians about the war that we weren't even really in the war. That is, it's, it's all them. Um, so unfortunately, yeah, the, the trains don't really meet much anymore. And um, I mean, I, 
I feel, unfortunately, that my, my book probably hasn't helped just in the sense that it's exactly the kind of book that they really hate in Russia today. Uh, I wasn't actually denounced for the book, oddly enough. It was for an op-ed I wrote in the Wall Street Journal about the Soviet-Japanese neutrality pact, Pearl Harbor, and the Pacific War. I mentioned, among other things, that uh, the Soviets had interned and sent to labor camps hundreds of U.S. pilots after they crash-landed on Soviet soil after bombing raids on Japan, and they weren't happy about me mentioning that. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I, I don't see things getting better anytime soon in, in Russia, certainly regarding discourse about the war. It's just become, I think, more and more chauvinistic, and obviously it's what people are getting in the schools. I mean, here, sure, we have our own version. You know, th there it's the great patriotic war. I mean, here we have the good war. You know, we have our own version, which maybe leaves certain things out, you know, that maybe don't always fit the narrative. But I, I do feel like there's more of a genuine discussion here, you know, that there was for a while in Russia, and unfortunately, I, I don't think that's true anymore. Thank you very much. Terrific presentation. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Could you, could you possibly comment on the communication between Churchill and Stalin in July, August 44 during the Warsaw Uprising? Oh, right. I mean, Ch Churchill, once again, is trying to take a much stronger line uh, th than Roosevelt, and Roosevelt just effectively isn't having it. I mean, there's a famous scene where Avril, Avril Harriman gets kind of dressed down, uh, you know, by Molotov, um, and Roosevelt doesn't even reply at one point when Stalin sends this rather insulting message, just, you know, telling the Allies he's, he's not going to allow any help. He's not even going to allow them to use Soviet bases to land on if they want to help the Poles in the Warsaw Uprising. Um, I think it's a classic case where uh, Churchill just didn't have the leverage anymore. You know, he could not achieve a better outcome because Roosevelt wasn't going along with it. Um, but yeah, as far as I suppose I'm paying more attention in the book to Roosevelt by then. I mean, Churchill by then is more like, you know, he's sort of this, you know, this heroic critic who keeps, who keeps losing all the battles um, because Roosevelt isn't going along with him. Um, but, I mean, it is, a, the sequence is, is it, it's quite brutal. I mean, the Soviets withdraw and obviously allow the Germans to kind of do their dirty work there in Warsaw. And then, uh, you know, meanwhile, while Roosevelt and Churchill are trying to get help to the Polish Home Army, Stalin is actually issuing orders to basically track down, hunt, and kill, you know, Polish Home Army fighters. Um, incidentally, the, the photo at the beginning of this book here, I talked about regifting gifting said. Churchill regifted a lot to Stalin, but this was actually Stalin regifting Harley Davidsons to his Polish communist stooges who were hunting down Polish patriots in the home army. Um, so, I mean, Churchill tried to put pressure on Stalin and tried to get Stalin to help in some way or at least allow U.S. and British pilots to land. They were mostly Polish, actually, the, the RAF pilots. I mean, a high proportion of them were actually very heroic Poles. Um, uh, Roosevelt did, didn't really give him the backing, uh, nor would it necessarily have, have changed Stalin's mind. I mean, it's hard to say. Uh, this will be brief, but I think it's kind of important. Um, why do you think Americans were so naive about Stalin? Why would, did we get all the propaganda about dear old Uncle Joe? Um, why was Roosevelt so naive? Roosevelt was a tough New York politician. Mm -hmm. Why did he miss it so much? Thank well, you. right, I get this question all the time. And it is, I, I can't say I have a, a crystal ball into Roosevelt's psychology. He could be, I, he obviously was capable of being a rough and tumble politician. He was extremely tough with Churchill. I mean, you look at the way he negotiates with the British. The, the U.S., the, the way he got Churchill to agree to the Morgenthau Plan was effectively by threatening to withhold six and a half billion dollars in phase two lend lease aid. Um, you know, even before lend lease. Yeah, they were trying to help Brit British, but the British had to pay in advance, basically by shipping gold across the Atlantic. I mean, he, he drives a brutal bargain with Churchill. Um, I think some of it is just the climate of opinion. Probably Roosevelt and his advisors, certainly Hopkins, probably to some extent his wife, Eleanor. I mean, they were just generally speaking more friendly towards the Soviets. You could, uh, there might be an element of rail politic. I think the way Roosevelt was kind of seeing it, particularly at Tehran, is kind of, well, look, the Soviets are, they're the emerging superpower, and you know, Britain is kind of this also ran. So let's uh, you know, kind of kick Britain to the curb a little bit. Um, I mean, even proposes to Stalin at one point they should subject India to a, a ground-up social revolution on the Soviet style. Stalin actually corrects him, and he says, you know, I think things are a little more complicated in India than that. I mean, it's, it's kind of amazing. Um, but yeah, why he thought that way? 
climate of opinion, I mean, obviously with kind of newspapers, opinion makers, uh, there's a lot in the book. I mean, if you read the book about uh, some of the influential journalists, um, um, you know, writing columns, syndicated radio broadcasts, they may not themselves have, have been communists, but they often had communists on their staff, you know, so some of it is kind of talking points that get repeated, whether it's about cotton or, you know, about the polls. I mean, even in Hollywood, I mean, you think about this, I, I, I don't have time to go into the Casablanca story, but um, it's quite amazing the way polls are either treated or ignored in wartime propaganda. You know, by the end of the war, the polls are seen as this, you know, deeply unhelpful, you know, grasping, greedy people, whereas the Soviets, of course, are portrayed as heroes. Um, you know, there was a very, very strong level of fellow traveling, if not communist influence, in the U.S. government. And, you know, a lot of people we know now, like Harry Dexter White in the Treasury Department, uh, you know, second in command to Morgenthau, he was reporting regularly to Soviet intelligence. We simply know this. It's a fact. can't really be denied. Um, you know, he had a handler. His handler even wrote a tell-all memoir about him. It's not like you can deny it. Um, Hopkins is a bit more ambiguous. I think he just, Hopkins was just committed. He just believed in the Soviet cause. Um, and I think in the end you'd have to ask Harry Hopkins why he felt that way. Um, but he definitely had a lot of influence on Roosevelt. And we have time for one more question. So between Churchill and Stalin, was, did one have a significant uh, diplomatic espionage advantage over the other? And what was the impact of that on their relationship and the decision making? Oh, Stalin had a massive espionage advantage. Uh, I mean, the so-called Cambridge Five were actually nine. I mean, in the end, the Soviets, you know, they had people in, they had people in NMI6, sometimes called MO4, this is kind of Cairo. Uh, they had people in the BBC. Um, you know, they had people very high up in the government. Um, in fact, an interesting thing about the, the intel advantage at Tehran, famously, the Soviets told the Americans they had to move into the Soviet embassy compound because they were German assassins afoot. And this allowed the Soviets, of course, to just listen into their conversations. It turned out he didn't really need to listen in because Roosevelt was inclined to agree with him anyway. Um, but he was always much better informed than the Allies were. Um, you know, he came to both Tehran and Yalta with exceptional briefing books. He knew everything about the Allies. He knew what their priorities were. He knew what his priorities were. He was just much better prepared and much better informed. Um, I mean, in fact, there, there were times when, you know, there were, there were concerns among kind of, you know, critics of the communist influence that you had to be careful what you would tell the British government because it would end up, you know, in Moscow. The Soviets, the Soviets would know it. Um, that was certainly true in the U.S. State Department and the Treasury Department, um, you know, some of the higher levels. Um, you know, again, it wasn't infallible. They didn't know absolutely everything that was happening, but they, they had very, very, very uh, effective informants. Um, and that gave Stalin a huge negotiating advantage at Tehran and at Yalta and, and at Potsdam as well. Although at Potsdam, Truman finally, of course, starts to kind of stand up. Um, Churchill then <laughs> gets voted out of office in the middle of the conference, but to, uh, during the period he was there, you know, he finally had an ally, really, in the White House. As we welcome Candace Millard back to the podium, will you please join me in thanking Dr. Sean McMeekin? Thank you.